So if I am, let's say, if, let's say I'm a soldier in Frederick the Great's army in 1740, how have things changed for me from the year 1500 up to 1740 in terms right. of equipment, training, just how have things changed? Well, you, you, you get clothes. <laughs> you get clothes issued to you, so you'll get sort of a set, a set of underwear and a shirt and shoes and stuff that can that you'll get that once a year uh, and you'll get a, a, a uniform coat probably um, every two years which is better than most of the German armies which was about every three years uh, it should be noted too that originally you would have to bring your own equipment to, you would, you to would, fight yeah, yeah that's in, right you know, closer to 1500 but now uh, things are different yeah, you would have that, uh, and your pay would be docked accordingly. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Today, I am super excited to have Peter H. Wilson on the show for his new book, Iron and Blood, A Military History of the German-Speaking Peoples Since 1500. Peter Wilson is a professor of the history of war at the University of Oxford and the author of several books, including Heart of Europe, A History of the Holy Roman Empire, and The Thirty Years' War, Europe's Tragedy. He is also a contributor to the BBC, LA Times, and Financial Times, and is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Peter, how are you doing today? Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm really glad that uh, that you're here today. This is a, a really fascinating topic and, and one that I'm, I'm really glad that you've written about. Uh, I feel like my knowledge, and you write about this in your introduction, my knowledge, and I feel like the knowledge of a lot of people when it comes to, to, to German military history is, of course, the First and Second World War. And that's that's really all I knew. And your book includes those those periods, but it focuses mostly on on what came before and and what came after. And I, I really appreciated that. So I guess firstly here, why did you decide to write this book? Right. Well, um, I I've always found um, German history really interesting, uh, and I think it probably comes from opening up a historical atlas. And you know, they are all the other countries in Europe are all shaded in and in nice uniform colours. And you look at the middle of Europe, and it's such a mess. And you think, well, you know, how how on earth was why was it like that? How did they get on? How how did they organise themselves? Uh, and and that that's the kind of basic question I guess I've been trying to, to answer for, for, for most of my career and I had the idea of, of, of writing this book for, for a long time and um, yeah it, it, it felt really good to finish it <laughs> I have to say yeah well I mean it's and it's a it's a big book I mean if you can if you're watching uh, right now you know you can see kind of the uh, the thickness of the book but to be honest like even though it's it's a big book I mean 500 years of of military history you know you can't i mean even just like some of these conflicts people write books that are just as long and so it, it seemed like such an ambitious project did that intimidate you to write 500 years worth of history in a single book well having having uh, you, you mentioned earlier on i, I wrote uh, the, the history of the holy roman empire so that was a thousand years so um <laughs> this seems this seems slightly slightly more manageable um, but yeah, I wanted I wanted to do something that gave the the, the whole broad sweep um, of, of this uh, on its own terms. So we don't we don't hear the story as as a kind of teleological inevitable march to 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 the two world wars, and then we don't stop the story there. We actually carry on, and that was the whole point. It was to sort of yes, that's extremely important. The two wars of the the first half of the twentieth century, but you know we need to we need to put them into their broader context and uh, yeah that was one of the purposes of doing it the way that it did well talk about some of the uh, the myths of of german militarism you know people often say about germany and prussia specifically that you know it was uniquely militaristic why was that not the case <laughs> 
Well, I think uh, it has, you're quite right. It has that, that, that image and, uh, you know, you, you say those words, Prussian militarism, and we have a certain sort of set of images come to mind. I mean, maybe we have Frederick the Great. Um, we certainly have the sort of pickle halber helmets and the sort of image that, in fact, that the publishers chose for, for the front of the book, which is a painting, a patriotic painting of, uh, of a battle in, in the the war between Prussia and Austria in 1866. And then obviously we have all the hardware and so on and, and, and steel helmet and, and, and the stuff from, from the two world wars. And that, that, that sort of, that image is very dominant and it's very visual. Um, and uh, it, it conveys a sense that, that yeah, the, the, the Germans have been somehow uniquely warlike and, and also somehow that they've been successful. And it's quite interesting that a lot of the books that, that, cover this you know conveniently stop the story sometimes perhaps in 1943 not even in 1945 so you know the, 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 there's a more complicated story there and and it, there's there's it's understandable why we have that that particular image um because it is actually when you scratch the surface you realize just how complicated it is and it's much easier to have a simple story particularly if we're trying to fit say germany into you know a the history of another country and, and so on. We, so we have something that, that seem, seems to make things intelligible and, and make sense. But I, I, what I've said is that to some extent, there is a reality there that's important. And the Germans themselves, some came to believe this and outsiders came to believe that. And that also then shaped their actions, certainly in the later 19th and early 20th century. Um, but there's a bigger and more interesting story out there as well. So just kind of talking about some of the, the symbolism of, you know, when we think of, um, of of German militarism, so the title of your book, Iron and Blood, I feel like I see the word iron a lot associated with the German military. You know, you've got the Iron Cross, Iron yeah. and Blood. Why is iron, why is that associated so much with German militarism? Well, it's, it's it, I mean, partly because they, they, they made those associations themselves. So as, as you say, so uh, uh, the... the the medal that comes from the, uh, the the so-called War of Liberation, so 1813 against uh, Napoleonic France, the Iron Cross. So that 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 then that was very much a part of about trying to create a Prussian martial identity, and it was actually originally open for for civilians who, who did good things as well, but became a military medal. Um, and interestingly, doesn't have a, a continuous history. It, it, they drop it, they restart it, and so forth. But I mean, iron, yes, it's a hard metal, isn't it? I mean, it's a sort of serious one. It's, you know, it's not like gold or something which is shiny and, and soft. So it has all those associations with, with, with hardness and toughness. Yeah. Well, let's go all the way back to the year 1500, which is where your your book starts. And it should be noted, too, that this is not your book is not just I guess we're, we're going to use the word Germany a lot in this podcast, but it's not just what is today modern day Germany. Um, it's all the German speaking peoples. So modern day Germany, but also Austria and Switzerland. So take us back all the way to to 1500 with this region. You know what? You know, what are the militaries of this region look like in 1500? Mm -hmm. What kind of weapons do they use? What types of battles are being fought? What was taking place in society? Right. Well, the the whole point of starting there is that the, that's where those stories interconnect. Um, uh, so Austria, Switzerland, and, and and Germany as well. So they they interconnect in in the Holy Roman Empire, which is, uh, you know, still a very powerful. It's the it's the largest and most pre prestigious state. There isn't another emperor in Europe at the time. Um, it, it is supposed to be the guardian of of Christian Europe. So. Uh, a lot of the conflicts are being fought in the east against the Turks, who have overrun Hungary, and they are a real world power. I mean, the Ottoman Empire straddled three continents at the time, as technologically and militarily advanced. So, um, a lot of the, the the conflict is is fought in the east, and it's about coordinating money and resources from across this vast area to uh, to assemble forces at least to hold the line the turks are usually the ones on the on the offensive and it's a lot of, there's a lot of siege warfare as um, 
and raiding as characterizes the conflicts in the in the east those in the, in the west are mainly um, between the Habsburgs so the Austrian family that basically monopolize the imperial title uh, and are contesting um, the control of various territory and prestige as well with especially with France uh, and though those are um, campaigns which are, are very seasonal I mean both the fighting in the east and in in, in the west and in, in Italy this is war in the age of grass I mean grass is your petrol you know you can't go anywhere with, until you've got grass that that fuels your your pack animals and and it fuels the, the horses as well and it's generally grows when the weather's better so uh, there's a tendency to sort of raise forces they then fight for six to eight months or so when the weather is better and then those forces are largely disbanded and sent home you leave some garrisons if you've been lucky enough to capture territory and then there's a big effort to get started again and this sort of episodic character war continues really into the into the 17th century because it's war consumes enormous quantity of resources and we're in, we're in an age where most people at the subsistence level so extracting a surplus from them is really tough uh, so getting the resources together um, is a is a great effort so war, war is a hugely costly and and destructive um, business in this time yeah, and it should be noted too that soldiers at this time, like you just mentioned, you know, they're not professional soldiers. You know, they're they're being disbanded and they're going back to live their lives. And it's not until later. Well, I guess talk a little bit about how that how that worked. How how were soldiers recruited, and um, you know, what did how did these armies form? So yeah, that, so they are. The, the, how our understanding of professionalism, I guess, is sort of shifts, and that again is, is is part of the book. So, a lot of them are fighting on a regular basis. So, uh, and they often are sus- uh, sustaining themselves through marauding in the in the kind of downtime uh, as well. So that war creates these additional problems where they would um, extort communities and so on for, for for further resources across the winter. But the there is the, the, the uh, the the type of, of of warfare at this point requires fairly large disciplined units to maximise the effectiveness of weapons. So these are principally um, handguns of relatively limited range and um, pole weapons. So the, the the classic one is the pike, which protects the the the, uh, the shot while they reload and is can also be used as a shock weapon. And anyone who's handled any of these. Uh, even replicas will know just how heavy they are and how unwieldy they are. So, the the to say these people are not professionals, I think would 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 be wrong. They have to have some kind of training, and unit cohesion uh, always uh, improved if you had a large number of a higher proportion of veterans, people who'd fought before and knew what to do. Um, so they are recruited uh, largely by offering them a, a bounty, a recruitment bounty, so a large lump sum that looks attractive, uh, and then the promise of pay. And they might get paid, um, they might not get paid, and that was a perennial problem. And generally speaking, pay was much better at the beginning of the century when um, the population was uh, was lower the growth in population across the 16th century um, created a, a, a sort of underemployment in, in, in many spheres uh, and um, it was much easier to recruit and, and obviously governments wanted to spend less. So pay began to shrink and that became a, a major problem. In fact, it was it, war did not pay for a, a lot of the men who fought it. Well, let's talk about the, the weapons real quick. Um, so you had mentioned uh, guns. How many? I guess at this this point in time, fifteen hundred. How many soldiers used guns? How many? How what were the typical weapons? Right. Well, we're so infantry. So firearms are primarily an infantry weapon um, because they're 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 heavy. And in the beginning of the period, um, there are sort of two types. Um, what is called the musket is actually the heavier one and requires generally a rest and then there is there's a shorter version which has different names and the range is, is and its um, ability to penetrate armor was was less too so there's a shift it's like 10 in, feet right well uh, i mean it it, <laughs> it, 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 it it varied armor gets thicker as well across uh, uh, to respond to this so there's a 
classic, you know, attack and defense uh, issues going on. The the proportion of firearms, it, it, it varied, but generally speaking, um, it, it creeps up um, to roughly half or so of the, of the infantry, certainly by the, the sort of middle, late um, 16th century. But one of the things we've got to think about, we tend to think, well, guns, yeah, of course, that, that they must be more sophisticated and more modern than just having a sword or a halberd or a pike but it's really the 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 modernity comes from the combination of all of these weapons you know we have the benefit of hindsight and we know that there are going to be these sort of refinements that come on and most of the the things rifling all of these things they've all been invented breech loading but the the industrial capacity to make these as viable weapons doesn't exist that's a it comes really in the in the 19th century so you know it's not it's not obvious that that firearms are necessarily better and in the 17th century um it's actually the the infantry suffer from having too few pikemen um, because they're seen as the steady soldiers around which the others can can gather and and and, and are essential for the formation so that's um yeah i mean obviously there are pistols too for cavalry there's you know there are the horse soldiers also have firearms but they're they're there again, they're fairly fairly ineffective, and mainly for close quarter fighting. Well, talk kind of uh, a little bit in this early period about some of the major powers. Who initially? What are what are the most powerful players in this region closer to fifteen hundred? So within within the empire itself, it's it's always Austria. Um, Austria controls around a third. Of the, of the empire and Austria going forward into the 19th century always has a much larger army than the Prussians do. It's only really in the in the sort of middle of the 19th century that that military balance shifts and the Austrians are generally speaking for most of the time into the mid 18th century at least, they are seen as the, the leading military power and the one that you copy. So a lot of the ideas come from, from the Habsburgs and the Habsburgs act as a kind of conduit as well because they're fighting both the French uh, mainly uh, and also they fight the Turks they're experiencing two very different kinds of warfare and so they are important for the kind of cross fertilization so the introduction of light cavalry tactics light infantry tactics a lot of that comes from fighting in Hungary which is then transmitted through from men who've served there with the Habsburgs or deserters from Habsburg forces uh, and so forth. And then within the rest of the empire, um, we have the Swiss, who are a sort of autonomous confederation who gradually evolve out of the empire and are very important as a source of um, uh, of, of ordinary soldiers who are recruited into other uh, European armies, the French, the Spanish, and so forth, have large numbers of Swiss. Um, and then we have the various German princes, of which there's probably about i mean we look at you know you get these lists they say you know 250 or something really there's only about 50 odd and out of those the the, the ones that matter is about 15 or so um that have some kind of military potential collectively the rest have have a potential but only only collectively but the habsburgs are the, the distinctive because they're the ones that can really act properly on an international level on their own the others really are only able to do that as allies or auxiliaries of somebody else. Yeah. And on Austria, I found that so fascinating because, you know, we think of German militarism and of course, you know, um, you know, modern Germany is what we think of, but Austria is really for the last half century, they've had the largest military presence in the, the German speaking world, which, you know, I, I, I guess, like we were talking about at the beginning of the show, it's all been shaped by World War One and, and World War II. Um, but I just, you know, I didn't know much about Austria. Talk a little bit then about kind of what defined Austrian militarism, uh, which is something that I don't hear too much about. Like, what is the, how does, how does Austria, how do they differentiate themselves from the Swiss or the, the German states? Right. Well, I think there's, there's a lot of shared culture uh, within within this area and i and i think it's better actually to think of this as, as different types of military cu- culture or martial culture rather than than use the term militarism militarism tends to have this sort of pejorative sense of of an of an excess uh, 
uh, and a way in which sort of mi- the the interests of the military are distorting the the broader interests of society. And certain, you know, I'm not saying that didn't happen. Of course, yeah, that good that, point. that happened at many times. But it's, it, I think, if we only look at it from that we perspective as a kind of critique, then we're not really always understanding what's going on. So, um, I, what we get is a gradual development of. Um, once we have permanent armies, so this is something the Austrians, again, because they have the largest force, because they have the, this permanent threat from the Turks, they are the ones that create the first proper permanent unit. So they've got 20,000, 30,000 um, troops that they can call on uh, around 1,600. Um, the others, they only have a, a, a few hundred or so at the most, uh, and then they rely on militia and, and men that they can recruit um, to form units when, when a war starts. So once you have permanent units, you then begin to get traditions building up, practices and so on. And there are certain uh, things that European armies have shared in common, and then there are others which are which are more distinctive. So by the time we get to the, the 19th century, you know, we got distinct traditions in military music, um, distinct traditions in the way that officers and men interact, and so on. Um, uh, the, the Habsburg uh, army was always a kind of multilingual, multicultural one. We tend to think of, the, of them as not being terribly efficient, but to be an officer in the Habsburg army, you, you, you normally had to speak at least one other language, so Hungarian or Italian or Croatian or Czech or, you know, all the other languages of the empire in order to, to talk to the soldiers. There was a, a separate kind of army German that developed as a kind of, you know, basic German that, that anyone from the empire could understand. So it has those kind of characteristics that come from this, from its own general character as this sort of multinational, multi-ethnic empire. Let's let's then mention Switzerland, famously neutral, but that wasn't always the case. What's what are kind of the defining characteristics when it comes to Switzerland? Yeah, well, we this is the thing that the, this idea of the Swiss neutrality and they must be very peaceful and so on. I mean, they 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 fight numerous wars against each other and 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 outsiders, and it's they're quite a, it's an aggressive power basically in the late fifteenth, early sixteenth century, and so they they expand over the Alps southwards into into Italy. So that's when the Italian speaking part of of Switzerland is essentially conquered and remains in in an, in an inferior state. Status um, uh, until the the Napoleonic era, when they're given equal rights. Um, there's various other bits that they've they conquered from the nobles. Uh, they basically kick out, uh, and so these areas in Switzerland lack rights too. So it's a very hierarchical society, and it's very fractious as well. It's it's the the, the spread of the Reformation. So early 16th century introduces. Um, con- you know, conflicts between the, the the Protestants and the Catholics, and these repeat into the early 18th century episodically. Um, but gradually, there's a sort of there's a essentially there's a kind of balance where no one really gains the upper hand, and they end up with this sort of uneasy sort of balance where they know that if if they if they do this too much if they disturb the balance then then they become vulnerable to outsiders and so a lot of the neutrality is about trying to balance the, the internal pressures with also balancing the relations of the confederation as a whole and its integral element parts with with other powers because the cantons are supplying um soldiers to to foreign powers which is a major source of income for the the cantonal elites and the French especially are paying um, so-called pensions, which were actually, they go to, into the pockets of, of the bigwigs in the, in the big towns, but they're also doled out as kind of uh, to buy patronage and it kept taxes low. So it was, it was a sort of win-win situation for, for about three centuries until this, this business gradually becomes unsustainable. Yeah, well, let's let's move uh, ahead on our, our timeline then uh, a little bit for the German speaking region. Let's say like the next I don't know two hundred years, which frankly there's a lot of violence, uh, a lot of things happen from fifteen hundred to seventeen hundred. But how does how does warfare how does warfare change in the German speaking region? Well, <clears throat> um, I guess 
it, it, it retains one of the characteristics throughout, and that's one of the key arguments of the book. I mean, we tend to think of, of Prussia, and certainly Prussia by the sort of middle of the 18th century does fit the classic idea that it is able to initiate wars and fight. Um, it generally has allies, but it can it can initiate a conflict. Generally speaking, if we, if we look separate from Prussia, and that's one of the things that does where the historical record really does fit much more of our popular perception. The rest of it, the rest of it is, is more uh, reactive. So, um, it, it, and it is, it can only really operate um, in conjunction either co- as a collective. So while the empire still exists or as pa- a coalition partner, as a, as a member of one of the coalitions. So, for example, the, the, the wars of the late 17th and the 18th century are primarily um, contests between French attempts to gain some kind of hegemonic position within Europe and others who are trying to contain French power. So the empire is nearly always in those anti-French coalitions and is supplying either directly as a member or its component um, principalities are often supplying troops so to the british to the dutch and so on who are generally speaking the 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 enemies and these wars against the turks are continuing the last of those really is at the very end of the 18th century so that kind of pattern is repeating and what the, the the big change is that um there have been some disturbances these external wars have uh, it triggered internal conflict, conflicts as well, and Thirty Years' War sees a lot of that in the first part of the 17th century. But the real shift is 1740, when the the new king of Prussia, uh, the man we generally know as Frederick the Great, launches this this sort of unprovoked attack on on the Austrians, who seem particularly weak at that point. Uh, and you know, it's meant to be a lightning strike and. Uh, grab the territory and it sort of comes off (laughs) but it it, it embeds this this austro-prussian rivalry which is then a a major theme really into the mid-19th century well let's let's talk then about prussia which gets talked about a lot is the reputation for for uh, having a very tough military is that deserved Talk about you know the the Prussian attitude. Yeah, yeah. To 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 some to some extent it is. Yes, I think the thing is, in terms of, of having a fairly high proportion of the population within the army. Yes, that's definitely the case. That is mitigated by the fact that in the 18th century and even in the 19th century, a lot of the soldiers are given leave for most of the year. So the army is very large uh, in the exercise period in the summer when the units are at full strength. And then from eight to 10 months for the rest of the year, the soldiers are released back into the civilian economy. And that's the thing that enables the the because they're not paid so uh, in that period so this this enables a, a state with very limited resources to to have this large force and that that really is the the crux of the problem it it has a first strike capacity and it has to win if it's fighting on its own it has to win quickly because it can't sustain a, a, a major war and that basic characteristic is then implanted on imperial Germany the Germany that is created when Austria is ejected from um, this long-running uh, sort of overarching framework that has dominated Central Europe until the 1860s when Prussia, Prussia kicks the Austrians out and has a smaller Germany grouped within what is known as the, the Second Empire or the German Imperial Germany. It basically has, those, the, it, it has that mindset and those same characteristics that if it fights a war, it's got to win quickly because it doesn't really think it's got the capacity to fight a, a long conflict. So if I am... Let's say, if, let's say I'm a soldier in Frederick the Great's army in 1740. How have things changed for me from the year 1500 up to 1740 in terms right. of equipment, training? Just how have things changed? Well, you, you, you get clothes. <laughs> you get clothes issued to you. So you'll get sort of a set, a, a set of underwear and a shirt and shoes and stuff. that can, You'll get that once a year. Uh, and you'll get a, a, a uniform coat probably um, every two years, which is better than most of the German armies, which was about every three years. 
Uh, it should be noted too that originally you would have to bring your own equipment you to, would, you to would, fight. Yeah, yeah that's and, right. You know, closer to 1500, but now uh, things are different. Yeah, you would have that, uh, and your pay would be docked accordingly. <laughs> um, and you would, you would, you would have limited rations. So you you get a bread ration, um, which you would often pull with um, sort of six to eight um, comrades. Uh, and you would commonly pull your your meager pay as well, and then you buy your fresh vegetables and and meat and stuff in peacetime. In wartime, you'd get a meat ration as well. And if you were a a, a, um, a so-called foreigner, uh, which could mean somebody from outside that unit's um, conscription district, so another Prussian subject, or it could be a, usually. Uh, somebody from another German principality, you would be um, permanently with the colours, um, but you'd be doing duty probably three days a week. And in the other four days, um, you would be probably working in the civilian economy as a day labourer to um, eke out your wages. The other the other thing that would make you different from most other German soldiers is that you'd be mo- more likely to be married um, because the Prussian army, to, to stem desertion, um, because it had a high number of people coming in from outside the, the, the kingdom, um, they allowed them to marry because they thought, well, if they've got their wives there, they're less likely to run to run away. Um, so your wife would probably also be working as a, a sort of street seller, you know, st- or stealing vegetables or, or something like that to sort of keep you going. Very interesting. Now, for for a Prussian soldier, I mean, obviously later on. We, you know, soldiers who were fighting during Nazi Germany or, or World War One under the Kaiser. There's, there's very much like a, um, like a, a, a nationalistic kind of feel and attitude. Um, were soldiers at this time? Did they see it as just a job, or were they like, I'm fighting for for Prussia and for the emperor? Um, what was kind of the, what was the attitude of of soldiers? Did they just think they were fighting a job? I think it's it, it, it. This is a really good question, and it's one that is um, very t- hard to answer because obviously we have even statements from some from from soldiers, and we need to be careful about. We don't take them all at face value. But I think there is the, Germany is characterized, I think, by a, a, always by a multi layered sense of identity. So the strongest identity is often your hometown. And you're, then it moves out to your region. So in the period we're talking about, most of the time that was some kind of principality or small um, state. And you move out to maybe a larger region and then finally to um, Germany, whatever that was, the, the empire before 1806 and then late, increasingly a, a, an idea of Germany. And that was that, that rootedness in, in locality was the thing that really annoyed all the sort of um, nationalist uh, ideologues of the late 18th and 19th century who tried to create something in common. And that German nationalism has always been characterized since then by this tension. You know, somehow we're supposed to subsume everything and have a common identity uh, opposed to the idea, no, I'm a Bavarian, and, and in fact, I come from Munich, you know. So that there's always been those sort of tensions. But I think what it has led to in the past is that people could fight for multiple reasons so yes they could have this motive of of a higher sense of of duty to a to a a country Uh, and i think that they did have that but they often have a more localized loyalty and of course they have loyalty to their comrades you're dependent you're fighting in very close proximity so you know you, you you if you if you if you're, you know, not fighting well, or you run away, you know, you, you, your comrades are going to suffer. So there's a sort of cohesion coming from from that. And yes, there are very mundane reasons as well. Of, of, for, for 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 many, it was to some extent a job. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about. I don't know if uh, you're just soldiers are higher or, or being a mercenary, and maybe uh, soldiers outside. German soldiers going outside of the German speaking region in America, you know, famously the British had you know, Hessian mercenaries that, uh, that fought, uh, on the British side. Um, how many soldiers were going outside of the German speaking region to, to fight as mercenaries at this time? Uh, well, there, there would, there would be a lot. I mean, I think that the, 
the estimate, the general estimate for, for Switzerland, which has a population of for, throughout most of this period of less than a million, and obviously at any given point, from 1500 to 1800, there's around a million Swiss who serve. So obviously, if you break that down by year, but maybe 80,000. So, you know, 80,000 adult men to a population that's maybe only 800 or 900,000. That's a significant proportion. And Germany was probably about the same. Probably, well, the proportion would be less because the population is so much bigger. But the overall number would be, I think, at least twice that. And so you, you have... Um, the, the sort of the French army, the Swiss army in this period, maybe uh, sorry, the Spanish army in this period, the Dutch army, perhaps a quarter or so of, of their um, uh, soldiers would come from abroad, and Swiss and Germans would 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 be the majority. And these people, and to come back to your your other question, I mean, they have they do have a, a generally a lot of them had certainly the officers had a, a sense of professionalism and a sense of duty. And so we can call them mercenaries. But we've got to remember, you know, in, in 1789, the, the French guards stormed the Bastille. The Swiss are the ones who are massacred defending the Tuileries Palace in 1792. So there's, there is a strong sense of loyalty and duty that they had. So if there is anything uh, unique to be said about German military culture in, in terms of soldiers for hire, it would just be that um, the population is so much bigger, which is why so many of these soldiers are coming from the German speaking region. It is that. It's also the hire of troops out was a means, of partly obviously, to get money, but some very few of the German princes make large sums of money out of this. Hessen Castle, who, which is, of course, involved in sending troops to um, America, do make money, genuinely make a lot of money out of it. And the, the, the Rothschilds, the bankers, um, a lot of their wealth comes, in fact, from handling a lot of this money at the end of the 18th century. So, yeah, there was, there was some money to be made. But a lot of it is, was, was really about forging political connections, making, a, you know, you're a, a, a prince of a relatively small area within Europe, which is becoming dominated by large kingdoms as sovereign states. So you want to maintain your status. You need to kind of link up with a, a powerful sponsor. The emperor has got to manage all of these princes, so he's not going to try to favour anyone in particular too much. So you want to sort of pally up with the French or the Dutch or, or the British who can put in a good word for you or support you, and it, it, it worked. I mean, the uh, you know mar they do this by hiring troops. They also do it by marrying in Hessen Darmstadt, one of the small principalities it grows much bigger through the collapse of the empire partly because they had married into the romanovs Württemberg is another one you know so forging these international connections was also about dynastic survival well let's 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 talk about the period um so we're in 1740 maybe let's move up to right before uh german unification so a little over 100 years how how did how do things change in the next hundred years, leading up to German unification in terms of the German military? Well, after eighteen fifteen, everyone wants peace, so there's there's a downsizing. So they just they fought the the, the wars against revolutionary France and Napoleonic France. Eighteen fifteen, uh, there's a downsizing. Um, we conscription remains in place because. That, that has largely been introduced or at least modified during the Napoleonic era, and they hang on to that. But very few of the eligible men are, are inducted, so maybe only a fifth of those who are eligible. So we have armies which are, have a poor social standing. We see this today, you know, in the situation that, you know, in, in Russia, for example, you know, such a small proportion of the of the manpower is eligible is inducted in the... the people might be proud of the army but they don't want to serve in it because it's the, the people who are usually least advantaged who serve so their military have a pretty poor reputation the the, the significant difference is the prussians adopt a short service model so their idea is to train as many as possible and the real thing that holds them back is just lack of money and that's what the constitutional discussions are in the 1850s and 1860s that the, the, the monarch wants and Bismarck 
um, who he's brought in to try to handle this, want more money to expand the army. Uh, and they are they are successful, and they they have their short service model. It triumphs over the Austrians. You had a long service model, uh, and the idea was you had long service. You have theoretically a big army, but in reality, because the Austrians are short of money too, these a lot of the soldiers have been given leave for a long time, so they're poorly trained, and you have no reserves. So, that, and the French system was slightly better. Uh, but when they fight France in 1870, again, the Prussian short service model, which the rest of Germany is now adopting, proved much more effective. And they're much better at mobilizing their reserves and the reserves are of, of higher quality. And that really explains those dramatic victories. Um, first, 1866 against the Austrians and then 1870-71 against the French, because everyone was betting the, the Austrians and then the French would win. People didn't bet on, on, on a Prussian victory. And that's what shakes things up. And people then really start taking notice and think the Prussians have unlocked the secret of victory. Yeah, well, in what, I, I guess, in what ways does the, the Prussian-Austrian rivalry, in in what ways does that uh, either influence or, or what advances come about because you've got these two powers that are both trying to one-up each other? Well... They, uh, I mean, when we we think of it of a, of a, as a rivalry, um, that's certainly true. But then we've got to remember that they are, for for most of the time during the revolutionary and Napoleonic era, allies. Um, and uh, there is also a mobilisation. Prussia, for example, mobilises in 1859 when the Austrians are um, fighting the French, and so there's tension. Uh, and the Austrians are very concerned about maintaining their traditional pole position within Central Europe and are resentful of the Prussians. And the Prussians have had you know, literally centuries of always being the number two. <laughs> and they, 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 for example, they were offered the, the chance to become emperor of northern Germany by the French. Uh, in the early 19th century, and they they reject it. They don't see themselves as necessarily ejecting the Austrians and and, and taking over. That's not always the plan. There's some advantages of standing in the shadow. And so the, the, um, the, the War of 1866... Is not clear cut. It's not that they're all gung ho wanting to, to to go, and there's considerable discussion as to how far they should exploit the victory. Um, but the 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 politics of the time meant that it, it, a further accommodation with Austria was 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 impossible, and so there is basically there's a partition. Um, the Austrian, the German speaking Austrians, along with the rest of their the Habsburg lands, are are, are cut out, and the the rest of Germany, as it were, is is now regrouped into this this second empire. And uh, can we talk about Switzerland a little bit too during this time? Because um, they do fight uh, very close to this time, their last battle. Yeah. So they do eventually become neutral. But what's going on with Switzerland uh, in this time period? Yes, this, the, the the Swiss have been sort of made and remade in the Napoleonic era. So they, they they've been occupied. They're occupied, in fact, by the Austrians at one point. And um, so the, the you know the survival of Switzerland is is sometimes in doubt. Bits of it have been nibbled away by the French and so forth. So it's reconstituted. But the 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 key thing in eighteen fifteen is reconstituted deliberately as neutral and it's a different understanding of neutrality so neutrality now is really keeping out of somebody else's conflict in in the past in the sort of the pre 19th century idea of neutrality was more ambivalent and that's partly because this idea that uh, you know both sides sh- should be treated equally was alien to the kind of christian world view you know that once only one side has god on its side and if you if you're helping the other side or if you're standing out of that conflict you're allowing the devil to do his work so neutrality was not necessarily a good thing but there's a changed understanding of neutrality and the swiss increasingly they recognize that they are small uh, they are a small state, and they're, they're resource poor, generally speaking. 
Um, and so this modern idea of neutrality becomes increasingly attractive and becomes m very much part of the of the Swiss identity after that point. And so, do they do, do they disband their army? What does the Swiss army look like? Well, they have they have essentially they have a militia. So in in so before the nineteenth century, there are, there are permanent Swiss regiments. But these are all hired to, to and only exist in other people's armies. So when the French decide they don't want any Swiss anymore in 1830, they send the soldiers home and those units don't exist anymore. So in Switzerland, there is just a mobilization structure and uh, a militia. So people do actually relatively limited training and then they can be mobilized. It, 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 to defend national frontiers, which is what they do in the in, in the two world wars, but the the standard of training in the nineteenth century was very poor. So with the last war that the Swiss fight, which is over, is at the last gasp of the kind of Catholic Protestant rivalry in eighteen forty seven. Uh, the the soldiers fire off lots of ammunition, but there's hardly any any casualties. Um, and there are lots of heroic paintings showing showing these glorious actions of in which you know uh, luckily only about a, a couple of hundred people were, were were killed. And then, but that's enough. You know, they realise that that this is uh, yeah, a bad way to, to to settle their differences. And there is a new federal constitution which begins to iron out some of the problems that had existed before. Now, being surrounded by you know, of course, Austria, Prussia, France, a lot of huge military powers. And is, are, is there a lot of fear that, you know, neutrality is just going to be like opening the door to letting some of these bigger players in? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and so, um, uh, uh, and the, the dangers of that are exposed in the, in the First World War. And the, the Swiss had been um, heavily dependent, for example, on the import of heavy weapons. They'd only just decided that airplanes were a good idea. And beforehand, they thought, well, you know, the, the, ma the, the mountains will mean that we can't have airplanes, so we can't have an air force. And then so, and then 1914, they decided to have an air force. And of course, no one will sell them an airplane so the, the 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 experience of the first world war is is a bit of a wake-up call and they are much better prepared by the by the time it gets to the to the second world war and there is i think that the there's definitely a deterrent value of the swiss and the swiss do fight i mean they they actually the, 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 there are a couple of dog fights and they shoot down some of the luftwaffe planes until they realize we've got to stop doing that because we could really be invaded um but looking ahead you know after after the second world war i mean there are attempts by the swiss to acquire nuclear weapons for example um to, to have a nuclear deterrent and to maintain neutrality and yeah, the, the, it, it's still a, up, up in, in, in debate. There there's a, was a strong movement in the 1980s to, to abolish the army, which is still a militia. It's not, it's not a, the professional force is very, very small, and it has really shrunk um, even further uh, in the last decades. What do you think that neutrality, in terms of the national identity of, of the Swiss, what do you think neutrality has done um, in terms of that identity? I mean, you've obviously got Austria right next door and, and Germany, which unifies these kind of just big outwardly, I don't know if we can use the word militaristic mm. in this sense, but, you know, what does this do to the Swiss identity to now become neutral? Well, it, I think it creates something which has been successful in many respects. I mean, it, 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 it has transcended the so-called potato pancake ditch you know the sort of the boundary between the the, the, the german speakers and the, and the french speakers and there are of course there are italian and romani speakers in in switzerland so it has overcome some of those linguistic um, divisions and religious divisions and it's created something that, that the swiss can properly identify and it's helped create a very kind of cohesive society but it is also somewhat of a myth because the idea that you are fully sovereign and, and that you can survive in a modern globalized economy 
um, is, is wrong. I mean, if you if, you know if you go to Geneva, for example, I mean, a lot of people are travelling in by train from France, where it's easier to and cheaper to live because uh, Geneva is so expensive. But they keep the local economy going, so they are, of course, integrated in ways that they somewhat uncomfortable with i think well moving along to uh to world war one and world war two so i noticed in your book that both world war one and world war two only get about 50 pages <laughs> talk about talk about why you made that choice well they got they got more than i'd intended actually okay <laughs> <laughs> um that that was well part partly the the there is operational history in the book because I think that you 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 can't understand write about war without understanding how it's how it's conducted. So and it's the battles and campaigns and so on do make a difference. So that's in there, but it's not intended to be um, uh, only only that. It's meant to to explain why that is the way that it is, and then what what the impact of, of particular outcomes are. So um, it, it was to do that. But obviously the history of the, of the two world wars um, required, so there's a lot more coverage of those than there is, say, for the, the Napoleonic conflict. But yeah, I, I think there are other people who've written excellent um, operational or campaign histories, and there's, there's, there was no point in, in repeating that. And if you were to do that, even at sort of eight, nine hundred pages across five hundred years, you know, you've got like one or two pages for, per year, so you can't really say very much. Sure. Well, I guess in the broader context of German military history. In what ways do you think modern scholars and historians um, should approach World War One and World War Two? Well, I think it, I, I think it helps to see them as, as separate but connected. I mean, obviously, there's the, there's a generation that that could have served in both, um, and the connections between them are, are profound. But uh, you know, I think we do an injustice to historical actors if we see you know one thing inevitably leading to something else and no one has any agency and decisions don't matter so you know i think we've got to recognize that there are that there are that there are differences and then i think it it really helps to try to put these into into context i mean there are reasons why the austrian performance was so poor you know if we only look at you know the, the army's formal structures or their weaponry and so on we don't really understand um, why they why they perform so poor, poorly and the way in which the the austrian army for example is gutted in the opening battles um, and they should have performed better i mean if you look at the tactical manuals um, they, they and you're they, talking about world war 1 world correct? war 1 yeah i mean the, yeah. the austrians they they you know the, the tactical manuals were not unsophisticated um, the german manuals were better the doc doctrines were better but of course they suffered from the fact that they were calling up reservists who'd been trained under the previous manual and so the officers think well it's much quicker if we just advance in a line you know, and 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 hope for the best. Um, so you know, I, I think that's the thing. We, we need to understand the sort of low level failures like that um, to explain outcomes, um, as well as the grand strategic ones. And we fit things into society and so on, uh, and we get a, a, a much better understanding. We get a better understanding about you know the interpretation of the war afterwards. You know. The stab in the back myth and, and 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 all of these things, and then when we come to the to the Second World War, I mean, I, I feel very strongly that you know there has been a lot of popular scholarship has, has separated out the Holocaust and the, the 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 realities of the of the Nazi control of continental Europe from the conduct of war, and the two things are clearly interrelated. I mean, you 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 can't you know you fight a the only way you can fight a blitzkrieg is to treat people abominably. Yeah. So post-World War II, what would you say has defined the the German military, the Austrian military? And, and well, I mean, you talked a little bit about not really the Swiss military, but maybe some of the military-leaning mm -hmm. things that the mm -hmm. Swiss have done. What defines uh, these regions post-World War II? I, I think... 
a, a, a major aspect is is the kind of cohort character of, of conscription. I mean, right into this century, um, conscription has been a major part of of, of people's lives um, in in those countries. In a way, say in in the UK, it hasn't been. I mean, conscription's wartime feature, and then a little bit into the post-war era. But this sort of cycle, this cycle of, of, of People serving, and in in East Germany, you serve for eighteen months, so it was a relatively long period of time. In Austria and and and, and West Germany, the service periods oscillated, but and they were generally shorter. But it's fairly significant, you know, fairly large numbers of men went through that that process, and it, that embedded these armies in into society, and they were very visible. I mean, if you travelled around in in Germany in, say, the 1980s and so on. I mean, on the Autobahn, you'd have these long columns of, of troops and also the, the, the foreign armies that were stationed there. And that's the other thing. That's the, the change, really, in, in certainly in Germany's case. You know, major Russian presence in Germany, in eastern Germany until ninety four. In West Germany, you know, major presence of, from the Western Allies, so they were occupied countries um, to, to a considerable extent. So the second half of the 20th century, the experience has a lot of things which which are, uh, are very different from from the past. What are you hoping the readers take away from your book? Well, I hope they enjoy it. I mean, you know, history is enjoyable. I mean, it's an awful, in a way, war is an awful subject. Uh, but we can't understand the human condition without looking at it, and and I hope that you know that that it's enjoyable read as well as informative. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, kind of lastly here. Um, first off, Peter, it's been a terrific interview, and there's there's so we didn't hardly even talk about after the the German uh, unification um, leading up to World War One, but. Yeah, or navies, navies, or navies. Forces. We didn't talk yes. about navies. We didn't. <laughs> the, Austrian, well, I guess... the Austrians had a big navy at one point. <laughs> How big? Uh, well, they were. Let's think. They were. I think in nineteen um, nineteen fourteen, they're ranked seventh largest in the world, bigger than the Russians. The Russians, of course, had lost a lot in uh, fighting the Japanese. Well, I guess we'll just have to let. The audience, they'll have to pick up a copy of your book to find out more about the naval situation. What are you, what are you working on next? I'm writing uh, a book about the, uh, what you do if you can't find what you need to prepare or fight a war from your own population. So resources that come from outside. So they could be human resources, it could be finance, it could be ideas, expertise, it could be access to, to neutral territory or resources, information. It's about that. Oh, very cool. Well, uh, hopefully when you publish that, you'll come back on the show yeah. and um, would love to chat with you about it. If people want to follow you, are you on social media? Where can people find you? The European Fiscal Military System has a Twitter feed, so that's related to this book. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, uh, Peter H. Wilson, uh, Iron and Blood, A Military History of the German-Speaking People Since 1500. Go buy a copy. Uh, go check it out from your library. Such a fascinating story. And Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you.